Hello, welcome. Thank you for clicking through to this video where I want to explain how an engine and a carburetor works in synchrony with each other in order for the combustion engine to actually work. In fact, as we know, one can't work without the other and in this video it, it explains those little intricacies that go on in order for that to happen. Now, it is a very basic explanation. There's more to these systems than what I've explained. But at the same time, I'm hoping I've got my point across here. And as always, this is how these systems work to the best of my knowledge and beliefs over the years I've been working and researching on these types of engines. So let's get going. OK, so what I'll do, I'll put it all out here diagrammatically and we'll go through it. So to start with, then we'll start with a fuel tank. And then, of course, we need some fuel. So we've got some fuel in there and we've got the fuel tank cap there. But down the bottom here, we've got a fuel filter. Now, I've made it quite large here just to explain my point a bit. And it's not to true scale, of course, but we've got a, a fuel line coming off there. And down the bottom here, we've got the carburetor. This is a four stroke carburetor for now. I'll just explain the four stroke for now. And then we've got an engine attached to the carburetor. And down here, we've got the inlet manifold that allows all the fuel and air to come out of the carburetor into the engine. And it wouldn't normally be this shape. This is more like a cone shape. The reason I've had to do this is because I've had to make the carburetor to a larger scale than it would be for this size of engine, just so I can show what's going on through the carburetor. That's the only reason. So these two here are not to scale. And so now let's take a look down here. And this is characteristic of the usual four stroke carburetor. We've got the float here and that float just moves up and down like this. In the usual situation, when there's no fuel beneath here, it would be sitting down low because there's no fuel there yet, allowing this float to raise. And as most of us know, attached to this float is a little needle shaped valve and that valve moves with the float. So when the float's down, the valve is down, the needle valve is down. And when the float's up, the needle valve is up. And so for now, I'll just explain that when the needle valve is up like this, then no fuel can come down here towards the float into the float's chamber. But of course, when the float is down and the needle valve is down with it, of course, fuel then can. This is the position it will be in. The float will be down like this and then fuel from the fuel tank under atmospheric pressure will obviously go through the fuel filter and down the fuel lines and into the fuel veins of the carburetor towards this needle valve. And because the float is low, the needle is also down and the fuel can go through and seep past it and it can fill the float chamber underneath. That of course now means that the float has some fluid to float on and so it raises. And of course it's raised so the needle valves raised with it and blocked off that fuel so no more can come in at the moment. So it's regulated itself on the amount of fuel that's entered the bottom of the tank there in the float chamber. And so we've got all the system now primed with fuel and we're ready to start the engine. So before we do, we've got to, of course, make sure that the choke is actually on because we've got the choke butterfly that opens and closes here. So we'll make sure the choke's on then. And while starting, the throttle butterfly here will be just slightly open, just allowing some of that air and fuel through. So when the engine starts and the piston lowers on the induction stroke, it draws in air. It's actually creating a strong vacuum as it's lowering. So that vacuum then is drawing in air out of the air filter and into this side of the carburetor. And it would like to just go through the carburetor and towards the engine at a pace governed by the piston. So it would just like to happily go through it to flow without any restrictions. But of course it can't do that because we've got the choke butterfly closed. But the butterfly has a little tiny hole through it and a small amount of air can get through this. And some air may well sneak past the sides of this butterfly. But again, it'll only be a small amount. Because of this choke butterfly then, there isn't as much vacuum felt on this side of the carburetor as there is on this side of the carburetor as a result of the piston lowering. There's only the amount this side that can be generated through this tiny hole here sucking through. And let's remember that this piston is still lowering, so it's still creating a vacuum. So it wants to draw in all of that air and fuel above it. But because the choke is in its closed position, it can only draw so much air in. And that really creates a little bit of a standoff between the fact that the piston wants to lower and draw all that air in and the fact that this restriction is stopping the air coming in. So what actually happens now is that a vacuum builds up in this area here as a result 
and it's kind of like a suction gun or a syringe when we pull back on the syringe or the suction gun air will enter into it but if we put our finger on the top and try and pull it back then obviously it's going to create that vacuum inside of there but the vacuum building up in here is a very good thing and that's the reason we're using the choke to create this vacuum when we first start an engine and I know I've already shown you here these little red dots that are indicating fuel mixed with the air but let me just show you now how that becomes okay so that vacuum that's building up here that strong vacuum is felt here on the main jet so it's sucking up out of the main jet and to explain this basically the main jet is like a brass hollow tube that runs all the way down and into the fuel just like when we put a straw in a glass of soda pop and so just like having a drink through a straw then that vacuum build up there in the induction area there is pulling up on that fuel beneath it so it draws it all up it sucks it out up to the top of the main jet and then draws it out into the induction tube there and so the result of this high level of vacuum pulling out of the main jet there is that we've now got a higher ratio of fuel compared to air going into the carburetor there and into the engine and that's necessary to get the engine started we need more fuel in there because the engine's still cold and so the piston continues to lower then and draw in that fuel and air and of course just to be clear when the piston gets to its lowermost point we're not drawing anything else in now because there's no more vacuum and then the piston rises up on the compression stroke there and it compresses that air and all of that fuel that's with the air and then we've got the spark that takes place combustion takes place the piston lowers again with all that exhaust gases inside now inside the cylinder and we've got some fresh air that meets the exhaust gases then the piston again comes back up and pushes out that exhaust gas with that air and so the engine will run like this with the choke on for several cycles of the piston of course until the engine's warmed up enough that we can actually turn the choke off so that depends on the type of engine we've got but there will be several cycles like this and then we can turn off the choke and in carburetor terms turning off the choke means opening the choke butterfly and so when the engine's warmed up slightly and the system is actually running well so there's no problems there but just to be clear and using it is a comparison for choking issues shortly if we were to leave the choke butterfly on for longer than it needs to be because as I've said now the engine's that little bit warmer then of course the engine will run lumpy and sometimes smoke excessively and the reason for that is because we've got too much fuel in there and it always was too much fuel even from the beginning even when it was just started from cold start but the thing is with the choke it gets that amount of fuel in there a larger amount just to initially get it started and initiate those first few cycles of the piston showing the induction stroke again there's so much excess fuel in fact that it starts to lie on top of the piston and line the cylinder walls and when the piston rises again it's more likely to look something more like this of course this is just a diagrammatic model here it's not exact to scale the amount of fuel in there but there will be a lot in there on the compression stroke and because there's a lot in there not all of it will be combusted so there'll be some incomplete combustion there and so there will still be some fuel hanging round in that cylinder regardless of the fact that the spark plug has just fired on this power stroke and as a result of this incomplete combustion then the exhaust fumes that are left in the wake of the power stroke have unburnt fuel within it and so as the piston rises now on this exhaust stroke it doesn't only push out the exhaust gases through the exhaust port there it also pushes out fuel that's been unused and anyone who's actually run an engine with the choke on for too long will actually know that this smell of fuel does come out of the exhaust they've probably experienced it and that the lumpy running and the excess smoke in some cases is all down to this excess fuel and what I'm trying to say here is when these systems are running correctly and there's no issues so there's nothing broken down on the machines the choke produces this kind of running almost instantly even when the engine's cold and we're first starting it in general that is of course but of course there's always exceptions to everything and that's because the internal combustion engine like this little one here isn't designed generally to run on this amount of excess fuel at any time whether it's warm or cold that is as I've said 
when everything's running smoothly so that there's no issues in any of the areas here so we've got fuel coming in properly it's good fuel good filtration carburetors working well engines working well under those conditions that's when I'm saying that in general this type of engine is not designed to run on this amount of excess fuel at any time even though the chokes designed to bring this high amount through and as I've said this amount won't result in efficient engine running but we need this amount because when the engines cold it can't efficiently burn small amounts of atomized fuel that it can do when it's warmer but of course when we come to start an engine we can sacrifice just at the beginning the engine running well for actually getting the engine started in the first place and at the same time we can't have this kind of uneven running for long that's why we only use the choke very momentarily and then we can turn off the choke and the engine will run okay under normal circumstances that is okay so how the four stroke valving system works then well firstly we can see here we've got the inlet valve which is open and that's because the pistons going down now on the induction stroke so it's drawing in all of that air and fuel out of the carburetor through the valve and onto the top of the piston and this valve of course will stay open until the piston reaches the bottom of its induction stroke at the same time this valve here the exhaust valve remains shut and airtight because if it wasn't airtight as the pistons lowering it would obviously pull in air from the exhaust manifold and that air would interfere with the special mixture of air and fuel that's already in the cylinder that the carburetor created so it would become more air in there than fuel and of course that wouldn't combust as well at the same time because we're drawing in air here from the exhaust valve there's going to be less vacuum inside the carburetor here building up that vacuum is vital of course as we've said to allow the amount of air and fuel to come in at the right quantities at the right time and so the result there would be because there isn't the same amount of air being drawn into the carburetor and into the engine then there won't be the same amount of fuel being drawn out here of the main jet of course so there'll be less air and now less fuel because it's the air the vacuum building up that draws out that fuel and so of course the engine if it would run at all would run very very badly okay let's have a look at another scenario here let's imagine that we're still on the induction stroke so the pistons still lowering and we've got the inlet valve that's still open allowing the air and fuel in to the cylinder on top of the piston and the exhaust valve is closed and airtight exactly how we want it to be the piston then gets to its lowermost point and then wants to come back up onto the compression strokes it's got all that air and fuel now it's compressing it and as it's on the compression stroke if we notice now with the valves both valves are now closed and that's exactly where we want them to be because all of this air and fuel now the special mixture it needs to be an airtight cylinder that's containing it so that it can be compressed of course and needless to say if there's any leak back from these valves then it'll be catastrophic for the running of the engine so as long as they remain airtight then all well and good but for instance if there's any leak back from the inlet valve here this is the problem we're going to get we've got all that compression in there ready to combust but because we've got leak back here with this valve it goes back through the carburetor and then it would head out towards the air filter and of course we'd lose the compression inside that cylinder there and the engine wouldn't run and it's the same here with the exhaust valve any leak back here and we're going to lose all of that air and fuel and that compression out into the exhaust there and so as we've seen now then any leak back from either of these two valves will lose all of that compression and air of fuel and it will leave back probably some but only a substandard amount and the engine won't run right because we haven't got the same compression in there or the same air and fuel in order for the spark to ignite it and create a combustion situation or at least not one sufficiently enough to force that piston down with the intensity it needs to be okay so let's imagine that the valves are doing a good job here we've got the air and fuel and that compression there at top dead center there at the uppermost point of the piston and it's all ready to combust and upon combustion let's imagine that some of that explosive material so some of that fire is leaking back through one of the valves and so it's the same sort of scenario then as we had with the compressed fuel and air we just get that explosive material so that fire leaking back through the carburetor if it goes through the inlet valve there and it's the same with the exhaust here but in either case we're going to lose that vital combustion pressure which is necessary to push that piston down at the right pace 
And with that combustion being necessary to force that piston down, all we're going to get here is a substandard movement of the piston. It won't actually be forced down to how we need it. And that, of course, will cause a loss of power. That's if the engine runs at all. And so let's take a look at another scenario with the valves then. Let's imagine now we're on the induction stroke again. So the piston's lowering, creating that vacuum. The inlet valve is open and air and fuel is coming out of the carburetor at the right mixture into the cylinder. The exhaust valve is closed, so that's exactly how we want it to be, and we know why now. So the piston goes to its lowermost point, drawing in all that air and fuel, then it rises, and it starts to compress that air and fuel till it gets to the top, and then we have power. Now, so far, so good, and we can see how the valves there are keeping the pressures inside the cylinder, as we've already gone through. And now we're on the exhaust stroke, and we can see now we've got exhaust gases in the cylinder, as we've seen before. The piston's now lowering, and the good thing about the exhaust valve is that it opens as the piston's lowering on this stroke. So it doesn't just open as the piston's rising, when it wants to force out those exhaust fumes. The reason it opens now is to allow air in, so we don't get a vacuum problem. It's actually allowing the piston to lower, else otherwise there'd be a vacuum in there, an airtight vacuum stopping the piston going down. And so this serves two main functions really then. We've just mentioned the first one, allowing the piston to lower, and secondly, as the piston lowers, it brings in some fresh air which mixes with all that exhaust gas, helping to dilute it ready to be pushed out. And the fact that the exhaust valve's open and the inlet valve here is closed is fantastic because inside the cylinder here, we only want exhaust fumes and air. But if we do take a scenario where the inlet valves open as the pistons are lowering here on the exhaust stroke, then what we'll tend to find is, as well as it pulling through there on the exhaust valve, we'll also have it pulling through on the inlet valve because of that suction, that vacuum that the piston's creating going down. And of course, what's going to happen there? Well, we're going to start drawing air through the carburetor again. And as air comes through the carburetor, some fuel will come with it. And that fuel will go into the cylinder, of course, and mix with the exhaust fumes and air. And then all that's going to happen then is the piston then will come back up on the exhaust stroke and push out all of that unused fuel. And at the same time, because this inlet valve's leaking, it'll most probably leak when the piston comes back up as well. So it'll also force all of that fumes out of this way through the carburetor. So now, going through the carburetor this side, we've got the exhaust fumes, the air, and the fuel. And that's just going to mess up everything inside the carburetor, get the carburetor dirty, and as I've said, it's going to cause problems. But to be honest, if there's any major problems with these valves, then the engine won't run right anyway, if at all, as you can see. But at least I've explained now how important that these valves are in running the engine, and how sometimes these can be overlooked as a cause of a problem. Generally, we go straight for the carburetor if things aren't running too right, and we forget about the valves. Okay, I hope that's given you a bit more of a holistic view of how an engine works, and how it works in with the carburetor and the whole system. This video is an extended version, as you probably know, of a few that I've already put out there on YouTube. But if you've benefited from this video, please could you like and subscribe if you haven't already done so, and if you know anybody who may benefit, please share. Thank you for watching.